she now speaks to James Denslow, a writer on Middle East politics and security issues based at King's College, London. Uh, Mr. Denslow, uh, the protests have been going on for some three months now. The killings have also gone on unabated. It appears to be somewhat late in the day for this uh, Security Council resolution to be presented. Is it going to have any effect whatsoever? Is it simply there to give the impression to some that something is being done? Yes, I think you're bang on. I think that the West has always found it very difficult to influence Syrian behavior, certainly at a regional and international level, let alone at a domestic level. And bear in mind now the country in the last week seems to have taken a step towards uh, civil war rather than any form of resolution. Uh, it really is uh, an impotent international institutions in terms of dealing or changing Syrian behavior. So I feel that the West is trying to use every single tool in the toolkit to change Syrian behavior. But as you mentioned in your pricey, the fact that the Russians and the Chinese would likely veto any form of Security Council resolution uh, means that ultimately it's up to what happens in Syria to determine the fate of the country. But besides the impotence, how much credibility do the British and French governments, along with the US and, and everyone else who is supporting this measure, really have? If, if they were so serious about stopping the killing that is going on, wouldn't they have used a stronger language? Because the language of the draft resolution so far simply talks about the systematic violation of human rights, uh, it demands an immediate end to violence and access for humanitarian workers. No talk of sanctions or military intervention, even though some may debate whether or not this is the, the right course of action anyway. Yes, I mean, I think you're right again. Uh, the idea is that the West is certainly uh, overstretched in terms of its military commitments in Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Libya. I don't think there's any appetite for uh, military intervention in Syria for a number of reasons. Firstly, the idea that the region is, is far more complex in terms of knock-on effects to Lebanon or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and secondly, the fact that Syria does have very strong allies in the region, uh, more, mainly, namely the Iranians and, of course, the Russians. Now, the Russians are the ones to really watch for in this process. I think the language has been couched as it has at the UN, partly because the, the Western powers don't want the Russians to be able to veto it quite off the cuff. Uh, the Russians have long-standing cultural, economic, and military ties with the Syrians. They're responsible for some 90% of their infrastructure and have large, uh, and the, even Bashar al-Assad's father trained as a MiG pilot in Russia in the 50s. So but, but uh, I feel that the West that, is trying it, to do... It isn't just about uh, uh, trade relations that uh, the Russians and others want to maintain. It's also about that precedent, isn't it, that ha was created by the 1973 uh, resolution on Libya, which a lot of countries, including China and Russia, strongly objected to because they felt the NATO campaign went well beyond its original mandate of protecting civilians. I agree. I think mission creep uh, is the characteristic that's defining the Libyan conflict at present. And bear in mind that across the Arab region, we have the only successful instances of uh, leaders being replaced in the cases of the military choosing not to defend them, whether that's Mubarak in Egypt or Ben Ali in Tunisia. In Libya, the military stayed loyal to, to Gaddafi, and that's led to a civil war. In Yemen, it seems to be a similar circumstance. And in Syria now, we're seeing, as I say, the, the beginnings of a fight back from the resistance that was initially peaceful, turning into a civil war. So, yes, I think for a number of reasons, uh, the Chinese and the Russians will not want to commit to sort of that kind of um, mess that it could uh, develop in the region. So yes, the Syrians, once again, it's about mutiny, it's about the security forces staying loyal. These are the key factors that could change the direction that Syria is currently going in. But what about the kind of leverage that some countries, particularly European countries, could have on a situation like this, given those uh, uh, long-standing historic uh, trade relations? Uh, wouldn't they perhaps have been able to downgrade their diplomatic ties to show their kind of disapproval of what's been going on? I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, the fact that the Europeans have, they're responsible for some 20% of Syria's trade, it's worth over uh, 5 billion euros a year, but the Syrian economy is collapsing as we speak. Uh, but I think from your previous report, the idea is that the state at the moment is fighting for its dear life. And the fact that it's willing to torture 15-year-olds in the way that it is shows you how desperate it is. So I don't think they're worried about any form of economic pressure on them or travel bans or, or weapon sanctions. I think perhaps if the Iranians and the Russians are somehow divided from them, which is very unlikely, that could change. But ultimately, it seems that the Syrian regime is concerned with one thing only, the survival of its regime. And unfortunately, unless something happens from within, that's the battle that will define the country. James Denslow, thank you very much for joining us.